I was reading in uh, scripture the other day, you know, about that day when Jesus will return and how he will come riding on a cloud and the trumpet will sound. And then we sang that song and I just thought, oh my goodness, what a glorious day that will be. Will I be here or will I be up there? I don't know. Uh, the word of God says that uh, no one knows when Jesus will return except for the Father. It also says in Matthew 24 that he will not return until everyone in the entire globe has heard the good news. So um, that's why it's so important to have missionaries and, and people out there who are sharing the word of God everywhere on the globe. All right. So from the New Living Translation from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, how good to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing the exiles back to Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them all. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond com comprehension. The Lord supports the humble, but he brings the wicked down to the dust. Sing out your thanks to the Lord. Sing praises to our God with a harp. He covers the heavens with clouds, provides rain for the earth, and makes the grass. He gives food to the wild animals and feeds the young ravens when they cry. He takes no pleasure in the strength of a horse or in the young animals. Know that the Lord's delight is in those who fear him, those who put their hope in his unfailing love. Um, just a, if you go back for just a minute, that last line, it says, you know, uh, he takes delight in those who fear him. So uh, in confirmation, we've been talking about this uh, notion of fearing God. And I'm trying to uh, explain that this isn't the kind of fear that, you know, if you took me down, what's that crazy road at Halloween? Hollow? Haunted, haunted Hollow. Haunted Hollow. Yeah, it's not that kind of fear because I thought I was going to jump out of my skin when my girlfriend took me down there. No, it's a holy fear as in respect, as in awe. God never wants us to be afraid of him. God draws us near to him to be in awe and in wonder of how amazing and marvelous he is. So that's what that means. Okay, we're going to get to it. And um, you've got a handout if you want to follow along, feel free you know, fill in the blanks, that kind of thing. So there's an apologist, uh, a Christian apologist, a, a, a Christian author by the name of Stuart Briscoe. And uh, he wrote about a funeral for a war veteran in which uh, the man's military buddies had a role in uh, the memorial service honoring uh, their fallen uh, soldier. And uh, so the buddies, the friends asked uh, that the pastor would lead them to the casket for a moment of silence. And then they said to the pastor, we'll just follow you out the side door. And if you've ever been to, you know, a, a service where there's been military honors and the like, well, you know, it's very, very somber and it's very precise, very much a precision kind of um, maneuver. And so the plan was indeed, it was carried out with just military precision until the pastor marched them directly into the broom closet. <laughs> and the soldiers had to make a rather hasty and disorganized and imprecise retreat. Now, the pastor made a very simple mistake, uh, got turned around, but the story illustrates that leaders, the people that we choose to follow, they better know where they're going. They better know where they're going. If you're going to follow them, make sure they know where they're going. 
because as leaders go, so go the followers. Now, I don't know, we're gonna talk about church leaders, but um, you know, we have all kinds of leaders. All of you are leaders in some respect, either leaders in the church body, leaders in your families, uh, leaders with your coworkers, you are influencers with your friends, so you need to know where you're going as well and that that lines up with scripture. Now, I don't know if you've heard, but we are in an election cycle. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah, Mrs. Ogdensburg, the village clerk, just rolled her eyes back. And, uh, you know, so it's important to know what these proposed leaders believe and do their beliefs and does their behavior line up with God's word? So it's really important, especially uh, this time. So we're going to read out of um, Titus, uh, Titus uh, chapter 1, out of the New Living Translation. So this is Paul writing, and here's what he says. This letter, and that's what all of these epistles are, they're letters. This letter is from Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And then he says, I've been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. And now, at just the right time, he has revealed this message, which we announce to everyone. It is by the command of God our Savior that I have been trusted with this work for him. And then this is who he's writing to. I'm writing to Titus, my true son in the faith that we share. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior give you grace and peace. I left you on the island of Crete so you could complete our work there and appoint elders in each town as I instructed you. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he has, was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and those who oppose it where they are wrong. For there are many rebellious people who engage in useless talk and deceive others. This is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. They must be silenced because they're turning whole families away from the truth by their false teaching. And they do it only for money. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. This is true. So reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to Jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth. Okay, so just a little background to uh, this letter. So Paul essentially has two what he considers sons in the faith, spiritual sons. Paul is the teacher of uh, two uh, gentlemen who have written um, books that are in scripture, Timothy and Titus. Timothy and Titus. And uh, this letter, it's believed to have been written about 63 or 64 AD. Uh, this is after Paul's been imprisoned once in Rome. He's been released but he has a second imprisonment in Rome later on, which eventually leads to his death. The scholars aren't in agreement about where Paul is writing from when he writes this letter. Some say he might be writing from the uh, major city in southern Greece called Corinth, which, from which we get the book of Corinthians. Or maybe he's reading from northeast point of Greece in Macedonia. But he tells us that he's left this young man, Titus, and Titus is a Gentile believer. In other words, he's a, he is not a Jew. He is a um, Gentile believer of Christ, and he's this male protege of Paul, being instructed by Paul, and he is on this island uh, of Greece called Crete. 
And things on Crete, Crete is the fifth largest island in the Mediterranean, things are pretty bad. People there are spiritually, morally bankrupt. It's an overtly pagan culture. So Titus is in a rough spot. He's trying to teach these pagans the word of God. And in Greek literature, uh, to Cretanize meant to lie or to deceive. And uh, occasionally you might hear it even today in uh, everyday vernacular. If anyone has ever said, well, he's a Cretan, uh, that just rest assured that wasn't a compliment. That wasn't a compliment. It's like being called a Neanderthal. It means that you're just a, you know, you're a jack wagon. Anyway, so um, the good news is that some Christian churches have sprung up on this island of Crete. And uh, now remember, the churches back then, we're talking about mainly house churches. So Here's the Apostle Paul. He's giving tips to this younger, young man, Titus, on how to lead a church. And uh, the takeaway for us, I think, is how do we, how do we uh, lead our lives? How do we, um, how do we vote? Uh, how do we um, follow leaders and how do we elect them? So here's the first point in the handout. Um, first thing that Paul does, he reminds Titus and he reminds us that the truth of God's word, the truth of God's word leads to real life. The truth of God's word leads to real life. So again, he says, I just read it, he says, I, Paul, have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen to teach them the truth. Why? So that they can live lives that please the Lord. They can live godly lives. And the truth will give them confidence that because they're living these godly lives, they're going to have eternal life as promised by God who never lies. Right? And he's promised that before the world began. So you see in these two verses how Paul reminds us that the truth of God's word not only shows us how to live a rich, full, rewarding life this side of heaven, but also if we embrace the truth of God's word, we're given confidence, assurance of eternal life with God after we pass from this life to the next. And that's why Bible study is so important. We need to know our Bibles. We need to know what it says. And we cannot just sit back and depend upon people like myself to try and interpret it for you. Because we all look at it with our own personal lens. And uh, so we need to know what it says in the scriptures. So um, the problem, of course, back in Crete, now this is over 2,000 years ago, and it's the same problem today, is that men, and I mean that in the generic sense, men and women, humans have twisted God's word and we've twisted it many of us to either elevate our status or excuse our sinfulness either to elevate our status or excuse our sinfulness so take a look uh, this morning at how man has twisted God's truth and the first way and this is number one in your handout is that God's truth can be twisted by legalism, which is a denial of God's grace. Legalism is a denial of God's grace. Grace, of course, we know is something that we receive from God that we is something wonderful that we don't receive. His love, his forgiveness, his mercy, uh, his generosity. We've done nothing to earn it, but yet because he's a God of love, he has given it to us. And he gave it to us through his son, Jesus the Christ, who died for our sins while we were yet still enemies of the cross. While we were still enemies of the cross. Secondly, God's truth can be twisted by license, which is a distortion of God's grace. So we have legalism on one end. We have license on the other. Those are two extremes we'll talk about in a minute. But those are ways that God's truth is often twisted. So 
I could say a legalist is one who attempts to be justified, that is, made right before God, by keeping the laws of men. Churches, whether they're Lutheran, Methodist, Presbyterian, non-denoms, doesn't matter, all of us have man-made rules that we follow. Some of them call them traditions, right? Um, but it's very important, very important, that the essential core teachings of the church that you attend or um, your friends or family attend is that they are sticking to the word of God and not elevating their tradition and their man-made rules above the holy word of God. And so Titus says, you know, you're, we're going to have false teachers. You're going to have legalists out there. There are many rebellious people. And they're, they're engaging in useless talk and deceiving others. And then he says, this is especially true of those who insist on circumcision for salvation. And basically he says, shut them up now. Why? What's he talking about? He's talking about a group of people known as Judaizers. These were Jewish Christians in the first century who preached to the recently found, uh, founded churches of the Gentiles. So the Jewish Christians preaching to the non-Jewish Christians of their need, their insistence to conform to the law of Moses, to the Torah. This is even after Jesus Christ has uh, been uh, killed and resurrected. And this group, they originated in Jerusalem. They're pretty much made up of the Pharisees. Their purpose, insisting upon circumcision, was to attempt to make Jews out of Gentile Christians. If, if the Gentiles would just submit to this circumcision, then they would be all right. In other words, they're saying everyone could believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but they also have to look and act just like them, the Pharisees. And so many people and so many churches are fallen um, prey to this notion of legalism. You have to look this way. You have to act this way. You have to believe this. You have to follow our, our uh, traditions. So I've said this before, you know, do I have any, you know, like this is the bottom line I, you know, have set at First Lutheran. Um, I think the bottom line uh, is in the creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father who created. I believe in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for my sins. That's the bottom line. The only other bottom line I've set is the dress code. You must wear clothes when you come to church and cover up your bits. So I'm asking. I don't care what you wear. I don't care if a guy wears skirts and yahe heels or a guy you know or because we ladies we wear pants we're kind of double-minded about that aren't we girls okay anyway i digress let's move on here's how max Lucado, one of my favorite pastors describes a legalist a legalist believes the supreme force behind salvation is you if you look right if you speak right and belong to the right segment of the right group, you will be saved. The brunt of responsibility doesn't lie with God, it lies within you. See, legalism puts power in the people and not in the Lord. It involves emphasizing certain non-essential external matters to the neglect of certain essential heart matters. Legalism distorts God's word because it focuses on outward conformity to man-made rules rather than inward conformity to God's righteous commands in Scripture. Again, that's why we need to know what Scripture actually says. Legalists today, like Pharisees and Judaizers of Jesus and Paul's day, they pat themselves on the back for doing their religious duties. They self-righteously condemn those who do not do those things. And often you will find that the beliefs of a legalist result in a kind of add-on to the word of God. 
an add-on to the Word of God, these man-made add-ons. And uh, so I went to uh, seminary, spent thousands of dollars so I could say very big fancy words like adiaphora. Adiaphora. Adiaphora is an add-on. It's not the essentials, but it's man-made add-on, the adiaphoras. So let's take a look at what some of them are. For example, there are certain Christian churches, including those within the spectrum of certain Lutheran churches, that will not allow visitors to commune with them, that is to go to the Lord's table, unless they are either a member of that particular brand of uh, denomination, or perhaps if they go and see the pastor first, and I don't know what happens in that. I don't know what happens in there. I don't know. But I have tried, because I want to understand, I have tried to see what the biblical basis is for that belief system and that rule. And I, for the life of me, cannot find one. I cannot find one that would justify preventing anyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ, the the crucified and risen Lord, from taking communion. So, of course, at our church, we have what we call open communion. It is open to everyone who considers themselves a believer in the crucified and risen Christ. So that tradition, that man-made rule, that's an add-on to the Word of God. And I believe, personally, it distorts the truth of Scripture and it makes personally it just makes me crazier than I am right now because I just hate the thought of being of someone being denied the grace of God that comes in the Holy Supper. You realize that every time we we join in the Holy Supper in the in communion that we receive a full and fresh forgiveness of all of our sins and an infilling of grace. Um, so that's just one example. Another example happened, uh, we'll just pick on the Lutherans for a little bit, because uh, they're my tribe, and I can. Uh, back in the day when I was at seminary, I, I started out at uh, an ELCA seminary, um, Luther seminary, it's like their preeminent ELCA seminary, it's the one they like to brag on in the holy city of the Holy Land, St. Paul, Minnesota. And back when I was there, they had... Uh, they were gonna um, they were gonna somehow join up with the Episcopalians. Okay, sounds like a plan. How about we all Christians just get together, right? Well, they they had this thing called called to common mission, which sounds good. Common mission. Okay, we've been called. What's our common mission? Well, the tradition of the Episcopal Church. Uh, was that they, you had to have a bishop, a bishop, lay hands on someone in order to validate uh, their being ordained. So you get a seminary graduate, they graduate, you want to ordain them to become a pastor, and the Episcopal said, well, just so you know, you got to call in a bishop to do that, because apparently he or she has the magic touch. And the Lutherans are like, Oh, no, no, no. And it was this big fight on campus. I mean, it, it literally there was a fist fight between some of the Lutherans on campus over it. It's like craziness. And then people wonder why people don't want to come to church. Yeah. So it's just an example to you, though, that we have these man-made rules and traditions, not necessarily bad, not necessarily good, but they're add-ons to Scripture, so we need to be rooted in Scripture. Here's what Paul says to the Galatians. He says, Christ, Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you're counting on circumcision, to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you're trying to find favor with God 
By being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to keep yourself right with God by keeping the law, you've been cut off with Christ. You've fallen away from God's grace. Yes. So this issue of distortion of God's word as a roadway, we could say the legalists are on the far right side of the roadway. And then on the far left, we have those who have taken license with God's word. Both of them extremes. And uh, in your handout, it says uh, one who takes license with God's word cheapens, uh, cheapens grace, which justifies the sin. God's grace always justifies the sinner. Cheap grace will justify the sin, but God's grace justifies the sinner. <laughs> so here's what I mean by that in simple language. License is the misunderstanding of grace. It cheapens grace. Grace came at a high cost. It came at the cost of Jesus Christ who died on the cross of Calvary for your sins and my there's nothing cheap about that. It's expensive. Some people say that the acrostic for grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches, the riches of his blessing at the expense of Christ who gave his life. You see, the real life-changing, life-giving grace of God is soaked with the blood of Jesus. God's grace is saturated with the spirit and the um of the Holy Spirit. God's grace is saturated with the spit that was hurled at Jesus by the Roman soldiers. God's grace is marked by the wounds that were etched into the body of our Lord and by which we have been healed. True grace changes the sinner and the difference is not what we do but why we do it. If the message of the gospel is all about license to do and act as we please, would Jesus have really said, many are called, but few are chosen? If it's all about license to do as you please, would Jesus have said, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. The gate is wide for the many who choose that way. He goes on to say, but the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. That's true. It's true. I remember my senior pastor in St. Paul telling me, Mary, we're going to be surprised by the people who are up there in heaven. And we're going to be equally surprised by the people who aren't. The problem of changing the way we live once we've accepted the truth of the gospel is a problem today, just as it was back in Paul's day. Paul says... Even one of their own men, this prophet of Crete, has said that they are liars and cruel animals and lazy gluttons. He's encountering heretics. He's encountering false teachers in the church, this young man, Titus, who wanted to claim their salvation by saying they believed in Christ and his work on the cross, but they didn't want to change how they lived. Right? Changing how we live, it's hard. I was talking to someone the other day, and their, their mother is uh, 90. And uh, she's, uh, as some of us are, even before we get to 90, set in our ways. And uh, her belief system is uh, pretty uh, narrow and legalistic. And uh, we both agreed and said, well, you know, absent a miracle, absent God's work in her, it's probably not going to happen. You know, it's pretty hard to change people. But yet, when Christ enters into us, that's when we not only change how we live, but we want to change. We want to do better. We want to be better. We want to honor God with how we, how we act and how we think and how we speak. So uh, Peter and Paul, sorry, I have something in my eye, can't see. Uh, Peter even says, there are pro false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. There will be 
cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who brought, bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. Probably some of you were here in this church when it changed from ELCA to LCMC. Much of it had to do with, over matters of how to interpret scripture and over sexual issues. And we need to know, again, what does scripture say? And we need to follow that. Paul writes to Timothy, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they've been held captive by him, meaning Satan, to do whatever he wants. You know, so many people have um, strayed from the truth of God's word because it's culturally, it's culturally offensive. Right? We're now in the season of everybody takes offense. Be careful what you say. You don't want to offend anyone. <sighs> Christianity can be offensive. It's true. It's true. You know, to say that there's only one God, well, that's what it says in my Bible. There's only one Savior. That's what it says in my Bible. Now, there, I, in fact, just so this last Friday, I met with a woman here at the church uh, who I had met at a uh, recent funeral I had done. And she asked if we could come and, and talk and she could share a little bit of her story. And I said, absolutely. And it was very clear. Uh, we have some different, uh, very different uh, approaches to the word of God. And... Uh, does that mean that I respect her or love her or um, care for her any less? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, so some of you remember, do you remember Duck Dynasty? Duck Dynasty. Yeah, do you remember that, Chris? Were you a Duck Dynasty fan? A little bit? He kind of looked like, kind of looked like Cy with that beard there. He's got to bring it down a little bit. Anyway. Here's what Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty said, and I just love, I love, love, love this quote. He says, our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. We can agree to disagree. But I do want to, do want to encourage each and every one of us who calls ourselves Christ followers to stand on the word. To be kind, to be respectful, but to stand on the truth and do not let, do not let this world corrupt your convictions. So you'll see at the bottom of your handout, it says, before you follow a leader, check his or her beliefs and pray, be sure he or she is following Jesus and that he or she knows the way. And the way is Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no one that's going to the Father except through him. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let us sing now, Oceans. <laughs> 